Good evening or afternoon, wherever you are. This is Mose Jacobs for the Barra Spoken Word. And I'm going to introduce our special guest for tonight uh, on the 3rd of November, 2021. And that is Ms. Patrice Greer, <laughs> all the way from Baltimore. And that is Baltimore, Maryland, not as people in Ireland might think a Baltimore in West Cork, which is really close from where I'm sitting right now. Um, Patrice is um, a very, she has two sides, I think she is, or many sides, she many, has many sides as we all do, but she can be very softly spoken and she is also a very passionate performer, which is one of the reasons why we've invited her to be our special guest and she will be reading from her own poetry and then we'll have a, a small q a if people have a questions we, you can either put them in the chat or you can just post them directly and of course at the end of the proceedings we'll have the open mic facilitated by Catherine over there so if you haven't heard it yet if you want to be part of the open mic you can put your name in the, the chat as well and uh, Catrice, you know, I mean, I, I can say a lot of things about you, about your um, subject matter and about yourself. Um, one of the stories you told me were about, um, you know, your, 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 your parental figures, your matriarchs, and you've had, you have a lovely poem uh, about that as well. I'm not, not sure if you're going to perform that tonight. What do you think? Yes, <laughs> Mama Mendes. So um, I'm not going to say without further ado, because I find that so greatly irritating, but I, I, I just give you Miss Catrice Greer. <laughs> and um, yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. And it, it really is amazing to be here since a lot of my uh, work that I have been writing lately is nature-based. And given that uh, COP26 uh, is in progress and just happened this week, um, this is timely. Um, climate change, I feel like it, it, there's something we all should be concerned about with that. And in addition to that, I feel that we are intrinsically as human beings linked to our environment. Uh, it's part of our community, if you, so to speak. So what I like to do is uh, I've created one, a series of poems. Um, hopefully my computer, she's, she's uh, a bit elder, up in age, so please bear with her. She breathes heavily sometimes uh, when she gets a little hot. So disregard that. You hear it. it just means she's working hard. I'd like to start off with my first poem. Uh, it's an ode to hope, especially at this time in the pandemic. It's called One Day Soon. It was published in Steel Jack Daw magazine uh, in April of this year. One day soon. We will meet in the clearing when the cornfields are scattered bare, the ears bent, stalks leaning sun spent and shocked. When the pumpkins plump nestled in the patch, rotund sunk propped in a bed of curling vines. When the ducks, orioles, and swallows start deciding on a V-formed avenue to a place where the sun-warmed spots are home. When our summer rises for the second time, we bid it farewell until it rises resurrected as Lazarus from winter's death after spring's first breath, after summer's next full bloom. When the hush of our breaths are sweet welcome, not a poison behind a mask. One day soon, we will meet in the clearing stand in the fall of what was meant to break us. 
one day soon, we will embrace, close this gap, hold on hard. The next poem I'd like to read is about the environment. And I don't need to explain it very much. It is called Yearning Through the Fog. It's a busy time. The car exhausts the fires, breathing smoke over the twilight, pollution laying across the horizon as if on a chaise, lounging. Overstuffed dumpsters overflowing with wrappers, peels, discarded boxes, and bench. Trees half bare, dangling windblown bags at their tips, trying to take a stand, hold back the school of loop winged, billowed bottom plastics flying by. The grass sparse, dirt scratched patches, concrete overtaking the landscape. We miss the deer and their morning hellos. We miss the murder of crows and their cacaws. We miss the foxes leaping over and under the brush, playing hide and go seek. We have not seen enough rabbits before dawn. That poem was called Yearning Through the Fox. Next poem I'd like to read uh, was also published in Steel Jack Daw magazine, uh, and it is called Today We Rebuild. The previous poem was published in Fevers of the Mind. Today we rebuild. So much left unsaid. Covered in hay and manure, we called it garden. Said it was floral and pristine said the silences were natural. Said the dark barked fallen oaks cut down by men with axes and strong armed into submissive woody death. We said it was the natural order of things. Seedlings left caged in winters we made, root systems tilled, separated, broken into pieces overwintered in summer. We said it was the natural order of things. Seeds blown from path to patch in need of fertile places to land, spread roots, grow, took them tagged, grabbed by throats, splash plant their fronds with red, corralled them, and we said it was natural lit a match on fields we wanted to flourish but wanted to reign over for all time. We left it as a glowing conflagration, never speaking of the blazing wall, closing in, burning down the fields we know are ripe and lush, the fields that feed us, the fields that nourish our humanity as whole harvest. We took spades, shovels, poles, dug in, aerated, turned the soils, migrated thumbing, brought in backhoes to drudge up the moist, worm-ridden fungi paths. We said, we forget we said we did not want to repeat. No matter where we dig or climb, we come upon the fire we left untended. That was today we rebuild, spelled extrajudicial killings, immigration, refugees, Holocaust. The next poem I would like to read for you today is called Come Home. And I did write that about George Floyd. He, many may have heard in the States about the, what some would consider an extrajudicial murder. 
on the street, George Floyd. And I wrote it from the perspective of his mother that preceded him in passing. It is called Come Home. These rooms sacred, we build placenta worlds of blood and bone. Cord by cord, cells churning with life, a zygotic landscape. Safe. Safe from gunshots, lethal force, blue bias, blows. Safe from bent tongued accusations, chokeholds, grief, tears, and pain light years away, the amniotic sac aglow. You hear only my voice, mommy. I walked with you, my love, my son, floating close to my own heartbeat, tethered in the mitochondrial house. We are one, my peace, your peace. My child, to lose you to this world that does not know you and never carried you is not the deep rooted tree of life I birthed. A premature exit is not the afterbirth of my labor. Call my name when the end is near. I will come for you. I will come again for you, my angel, my sweetness. You will reside here with me. Rest in peace, come home, breathe, breathe, breathe. The, that particular poem is in, uh, can be, it's located in fears of the mind. Um, they were very kind to publish that uh, in a timely way uh, at the remembrance of George Floyd. I'd like to take a short shift to um, a few nature poems that aren't as heavy. Uh, one will be published in uh, Welshire Poetry Society. Um, Anthology, The Trawler. It is called, um, oh, well, look at there. I made a mistake. I'll have to pull it up. I pulled up the wrong one. <laughs> Let's switch gears, guys. So um, while I'm doing that, I'll do another one. I'm going to take you to outer space for a moment. And this one is called Cortical Cartography. Some may say, well, what does that have to do with nature? I think a lot. It's still part of our natural environment. If you consider yourself part of the solar system, then this poem would make sense. Um, it is called Cortical Cartography. And I used it to give thanks uh, I'm a brain injury, I'm uh, suffering from a brain injury and recovering and doing well. I can read poems. I can't read whole novels, but I can read magazines, articles, things like that. And I give thanks for the feeling, cortical cartography. I give thanks for you, bravely doing this again. Traveling synapse by synapse, trails of electric pulses, jumping black hole gaps that used to remember. Holding the dead space, a new soma body, birthing from bleating darkness. Show us the nucleus of the middles, what we were made of. Ixons spread like kamikaze flying squirrel bodies with arms akimbo, reaching, dendrites touching, grateful for even this axon potential, 
sometimes on, sometimes off. Praise for brave synaptic dives and jumps, grateful for rebirth mileage, insulating, protecting, making sure that we traffic on our way by the quickest route, charged in this dark matter discovery space. This astronomy, building a new wrinkled city of light, crevices, crannies, gyri and sulci, ridges and valleys, jellied crinkled mass, sectioned by lobes, all speaking trillions, simultaneous synaptic voices prayerfully all at once. This chatter mines the neuronal network and we build a whole new world. Sorry, there seems to be background noise in my apartment complex. I hope it's not too overwhelming. Um, I don't hear that. We don't hear that. Oh, really? Okay. Gee whiz. Well, thank goodness. Uh, I have a couple poems left and I will end on Mama Menzas. One is about monogamy and it is Cygnus monogamous. Uh, speaking through the life of a swan. You could pick that up from Cygnus, yes. She goes by as if skating on the pond, as if levitating above the marsh city below, above the frogs, fish, worms, grassy fields swaying her on. Never matter, each day like the other, neck craned mute in her quiet, watery solitude. Uncoupled, there is only one. Her feathers ivory winged back, fluttering only slightly. A hint of a dream and desire, almost yawning at the mundane. And there it comes. The last and only one, their foreheads touch single-hearted entwined necks as growing vines, coupled as one boated at the helm on the same course, preparing to last for always. And I have two poems left that I would like to read to you. These are performance pieces. This poem I'm about to read is called Pick Me. It is a mixture of song and poetry. It is an allegory of an orchard, an orange orchard. It is about personhood. Uh, do you wait to be chosen or do you choose yourself? Some may apply it to relationships, but it's also about just choosing yourself, your own autonomy. I also put a dig in there to John Milton We'll discuss that in another time. Um, pick me. In the orchard they hang, swaying in the morning's breath, long since ripened, dry puckered rhymes, leathered, turning on the nub. Drinking the dawn and the dew, each one swaying. Pick me, pick me. These waters run deep, running, running free. Pick me, pick me in the sun. When the day is done, which one? Oh, pick me. These waters run deep, running, running free. Pick me, pick me. Which one? This one, nimble. Peeling back its pebbled skin, hiding the sheathed face of her fruit. 
unthreads the pith. Gentle, gentle, each ribbon strand spinning gold, setting her free from imprisoned rind, pulling back stomach membranes. The opaque veil of her sectioned, despite and bitter seeds. She is there, swimming, juiced, shedding her skins, her fruity soul skinless, dripping, cradled in the lush grasses, sprung to hold her up. The fall was a jump. She chose herself. These waters run deep, running, running free. Pick me, pick me in the sun when the day is done. Pick me. These waters run deep, running, running free. Take me, take me, pick me. And my final poem tonight will be Mama Menzas. It was published in Ice Flow Press last year in 2020, about this time, maybe. And uh, it was the poem that was nominated for the Pushcart Prize for 2021 by Ice Flow Press. Um, it is a sprawling, it is a sprawling spoken word performance poem, which is why it'll be my last poem today because it's very, it takes some time and it's, it's written like an incantation, almost a prayer for healing, uh, mother energy. And just to be clear, that nurturing energy that anyone can possess inside of them, that nurtures, that heals. Mama Menzas. We girls fly home to our mamas again for braided hair and brown sugar laced baked bean kisses and hugs. Hugs for time. Time to remember that we are priceless princesses. Not 595, 8 by 10 glossies spread open at the crease, laying still for all waiting for anything but our pages to be turned over. Our glossy now dull, our edges shorn and tattered by feigning eyes and hands groping, needing, needing her fingers now in my hair, now needing close to the scalp. My trembling fingers fall too close to the edge of a scar-flecked heart. And oh, I am a leper, fingers interlacing themselves with wounds, wounds encrusting a reservoir of stagnant pains, slowly healing. We girls fly home on a 747 impulse to know where it was we were supposed to be going. Images of your strength, mama, come speeding at the wind a little compass compassion to pass on. Little understandings bear the gifts of directions wrapped in smooth, hushed voices. Pearls, we string our voices together and we wear them round our necks like precious stones. Totems to carry us, totems to pass on. Full mouths of color. The busy open fans spread before us, purring away pain, hovering like afternoon heat, cloaking fervid prayers. We kneel together. And she calls God like church on Sundays. We girls fly home on tattered wings, broken by unloving wings. Mama mends us. And so she heals. Mama Menzas. Apothecaries, 
for our souls. Mama Mentas. She, the mama, heals. Mama Mentas. Mama Mentas. We girls fly home to our mamas to learn to bury and not marry our dead. We are not weak, but learning to love ourselves and to share that love. We are not weak. We girls fly in blues and in greens, earth goddesses, winged crones. To combine strengths and loves, we build homes for the homeless, our sons, our daughters. We girls, broken hearts still beating, pushing us on tattered wings that unravel in gusty wind, fly broken, in strength, we girls continue to fly, pushing to home. We heal ourselves in love, mama mends us. We are not weak, just needing our mamas, pushing to live, to fly. And so she heals, mama mends us. And so she heals, mama mends us. Mama Menzas. Pushing. Mama Menzas. And so she heals. Mama Menzas. Mama Menzas. Mama Menzas. And so she's healed. Mama Menzas. Mama Menzas. Mama Menzas. And so she's healed. Mama means us. Mama means us. Mama means us. Mama means us. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very, very much, Catrice, for your performance, your poetry. And welcome everyone who's since joined us. Um, following Catrice's performance and reading, uh, we're going to do a little Q and A. Is there anyone who has a question for Catrice about one of her poems or about anything, everything? <laughs> There's a lot of very, very positive comments in the chat as well. I have a question for Catrice. I would like to know if she has a book that I can buy. No, not yet. I have not published a book as of yet. I am working on a book. Uh, for a long time, I just didn't. Well, the world has changed. Things are much more accessible now on the internet. And, you know, when I was writing quite a long time ago, um, a few decades ago, it, books were really academia. You know, you be either belonged to that or you did not. And if you self-published, it just wasn't exactly something that was smiled upon. You know, there were circles, strata, um, but the world has changed. So mm -hmm. because of those changes and because it makes literature so much more accessible, it gives me time now to consider that. So I've been working on my manuscript um, I, I probably won't be ready until 2023 or late 2022 for printing, but I'm working on something. In the meantime, please feel free to read my publications in different journals. Thank you for asking, Brian. Well, you know, Catrice's book is just going to be spectacular. So. Catrice, could you, could you elaborate a little bit? Because it's always very mysterious and interesting how you know people write poetry and it starts somewhere and then then you edit it uh in most cases can, can you tell me roughly what you're working on if you say like you know it's going to take another year to edit it how you how you fight the strength and yeah well, I something have, about the process um, sure 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 well in my case i was one of those people who wrote on stuff you know, bits of paper, paper towel, um, and stuck it in bins, you know, or have folders of stuff. And so 
uh, I'm coming from a very interesting backlog of things. <laughs> First of all, they need to look human and, you know, put, put it in proper form. And then, uh, you know, really looked over because I'm a different person now than I was then. So the voice is going to be a little different. So I'm, I'm literally, it's not really that hard to do because the person I was then isn't the person I am now. So I'm, I'm editing someone else's voice. Huh. So um, if that, if that, if that makes sense. And uh, so what will be happening is over, over the winter is what I'm, I've been working on bit by bit, just taking a poem at a time, looking at it and seeing what fits today versus yesterday, what stands the test of time. And uh, what will be happening is that sort of thing can be done by the midwinter then you need a, a nice editor, someone very reputable. They look over your stuff and tell you whether you're facing reality or not about these things. Then you go back into your editing process again. And that takes us somewhere late summer. And that means that I'm all this time I'm building relationships with different publishers, trying to decide who's the best fit. I do have a short list, uh, but you know they need to choose you too. And when they choose you, let's say let's say someone picks me up in this this coming next fall, 2022. Well, they have their own roster of when they're publishing books. They're not going to publish you right away. So that's going to be 2023 sometime. And that's what that process looks like. But in terms of me going inside and editing my work, yeah, I'm ex I'm I'm going in and I'm looking at two different me's or maybe three or four me's, uh, all my different voices from before. And I'm so different from that person that I, I'm just looking at those words, how they fit, and then literally infusing bits of myself back in there so that when I put, as I put my manuscript together and place the pieces together, it makes sense. It's the same person throughout. Uh, mm -hmm. There'll still be a growth. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if I, I'm explaining that in a way that makes sense to anybody else but me, but that, that is the best way that I can, can explain that. I'm, I'm going in and I'm looking for cohesion. Um, I'm looking at uh, techniques that, I, you know, that I've honed over time. Are they showing up? Do they need to be refined in that piece of work? Each bit at a time. Now, it's interesting because, um, yeah, I was thinking when you were saying that, that you could also decide to keep many voices. Like, do you know the poem, poem The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot? T.S. Eliot, yes, he's my, he's one of my faves. And, you know, when he... He talks about a lot of things, you know, the artist and, his, and the individual talent, if you've read that essay, and we pull from everywhere, right? Um, we're pulling from all kinds of artists everywhere. So we're, each artist was really an amalgam of the artists that came before them, that influenced them. So even within myself, there are many, many, many voices outside of me, plus my own over time. Right. And yes, I would be keeping them because I can't quite change who I was, but I can make sure that there are bits that create the links that make it all come together. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Colm Scully says, Catrice, what is the poetry scene like in Baltimore? Is there spoken word events? Is there open mic mics? Well, yeah, pretty much like anywhere. I mean, there's um, there's spoken word here. There's a lot of spoken word here. Um, and there's poetry for the page here. Like, I, uh, it depends on where you're going. Like, um, what's interesting is we have some places called Bus Boys and Poets, for instance. And it's like a franchise. Um, there are three so far, excuse me, in the Maryland area, and they are pretty amazing and very cool. And uh, uh, they're accepting of many age ranges from the young to the, to the more seasoned. So it means that it's fairly diverse. But I mentioned the ages because a lot of young people flock to that because they can express themselves. They can get up. You know, a lot of young people are very kinetic and they want to speak out loud. They want to be heard. And it means a lot to stand at the mic in front of other people and be heard 
and be taken very seriously. So we have a lot of venues like that coming up. And to me, that is very, very important. Um, and progress, progress in many ways. Yeah, it sounds really good that, that young people take part as well, because here it seems to be a bit, bit segregated, but you know, between older people going for the poetry and younger people maybe staying in front of their screens or something like that. Could you say something about this franchise? Because I'd never heard of a poetry fran franchise before. <laughs> so, <laughs> w w because in, like in Ireland, a lot of poetry events are in pubs or, you know, that, that's sort of a community hub in a way, but is this like a, uh, is this a, uh, what's, what's it like, the, the franchise? I mean, Not it's a, a dedicated oh. space. Yeah, so it is, it's a dedicated space. They're, they're very nice. I mean, it's sort of like a glamorous pub, so to speak. I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty zhuzhed up. You've got a, they're like a bistro. I mean, it's, there are tables where you can eat and it's really great food. Uh, They've got a stage and it's, you know, they're very modern. It's very different than uh, the pubs that you're speaking of. That's similar, something similar to what I may have experienced in the 90s. There were spaces, you know, if it wasn't a pub, it was a center, you know, uh, and a rec center or something or a college or a university, you know, um, that was, that would give a special event so that young people could do these things. But in here we had something called Deaf Comedy Jam that uh, aired on TV in the 90s. Uh, and that was, rap was having its hey, heyday, you know, and it just really caught on. I mean, so the emergence of that plus on TV, it inspired people to just create these spaces. So the 2000s saw the, the, the aughts, saw this explosion of building and proprietorship. And, uh, and here we are today. Yeah. We still have also spaces where people are bringing their books and doing dedicated readings. So here that may be at Enoch Pratt in Maryland, I can speak for my state. So um, we have something here called City Lit. Uh, and uh, they put on wonderful events. And sometimes the events are at Enoch Pratt Central Library, which is downtown. The library itself also puts on some poetry events too. So you have people coming and different universities and colleges as well. So maybe doing that at their places as well. So you have people who are poets from the page who are publishing, who are also coming and reading their poems at dedicated poetry readings. It's, I live down the street from a bookstore called The Ivy, very pop, uh, popular bookstore. Uh, a lot of academics love it, um, but so do community members. And so they have poetry readings sometimes, or right now during the pandemic, they have them outside um, on the patio of the uh, bookstore. I mean, there's a little something for everyone. And I think the scene is growing it's growing. We don't necessarily have poetry festivals yet. We have some poetry festivals here and there, like Atlanta has one, there's one in Atlanta, but I think that kind of thing is also growing too. Sounds great. Uh, yeah, New York might be a hub for that as well. They have some really amazing stuff, the New Yorkans, and it's just, there's a lot really ripe in culture. Thank you. Therese, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I just love your poetry. You know that I love your voice and I love you. Um, but the thing that really fascinates me uh, when you are able to engage and give voice in a very intricate way to TBI, to your disability, like you engage your brain, you're looking at the synopsis. And so many people, when they have serious uh, disabling problems, retreat from it, you know, it's fearful. I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing to share with other people because it would give them courage. But, you know, kind of, you know, it's a kind of stupid question in a way, but like, what do you attribute, you know, your advancing towards it and trying to take hold of it and comprehend it, you know, because it, it is such a serious and ex probably exhausting comeback, right, to do all the work that, that you had to do. Uh, it is. Um, well, 
and that's an excellent question. And I'm grateful that you asked me that. Uh, it's a combination of things. One, I'm, I, yes, it is exhausting, but it's rewarding uh, and healing. So it is very rewarding, but it is exhausting process healing from my injuries. I live down the street from a, a hospital in which I am one of the outpatient uh, clients for the brain injury program here. So um, it's very helpful to live nearby. And I bring that up because I, I had decisions to make. I've, I've been through a lot of different kinds of challenging things and so have many people, right? And so I, I had a decision to make in terms of facing depression and anxiety about it and the the answers that were not yet there about my future. Um, would I just keep tumbling into despair and feeling very disempowered about something that I, at that point, really don't have much control over? I'm going to heal or I'm not going to heal or I'm going to accept each moment and move forward. My faith plays a lot into that. For me personally, I am Christian. So I personally, my faith and how I see the world, my perception has a lot to do with how I focus on the future, how I release my grasp on what I believe must be uh, and allow what is to be and understand that there's so many things bigger than myself. Um, it, it really helps me to not, it's, it's not a magical cure. It's just, I don't, I'm not sure if I can explain it well enough to say, it just gives me more support, more hope, more strength um, beyond myself. If it was left up to me, uh, I needed a team. <laughs> Uh, besides that, um, I'm curious about life. You know, I'm curious about so many things as a human being. And I love science. And um, we have a few scientific minded people in our family. Uh, so that kind of thing just keeps me being curious about it all. I want to know more. I want to know what's going on and how it works and what makes it um what makes things heal, what makes them not. Um, and so for me, putting gratitude first helps move a lot of things out of the way so I can take many steps forward. And if, like any human being, I find that out over time. You know, of course I have other feelings. You know, I feel angry, I feel sad, I feel anxious. I go through all my feelings just like everyone else. But it's what I attend to the most that helps me. I, I hope that great response. Yes, indeed. Um, is uh, I, I have one more question. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a Teresa a question or a comment? I don't know. Okay, inspiring. I haven't, yes. okay. I haven't read everyone's. Uh, chats yet and I was curious if I could maybe ask a question I'm always curious how does the work if the if the work the everyone's work isn't going to connect with everyone there's something for everybody right and for for those for whom this work connected with you can you tell me how it made you feel um there may have been one piece in particular a line how did it make you feel what was the impact for you? I, I really would like to hear from you. Any brave I felt, souls? <laughs> I felt like I was listening to the truth. I felt that you wouldn't compromise the truth. And that always strengthens me. For me as well, the poem about um, George Floyd we had um, a similar incident during COVID here in Ireland when uh, George in Kensho was shot dead by our, one of our guards, the Gardaí, the police in Ireland, um, when there was no need, he, he was young. 
and he was also intellectually challenged and black. Um, and it was so similar. And the, the outcry afterwards was similar as well. The um, vigils, the marches, the demos, all that. Um, and it's ongoing, it hasn't been resolved. Um, and yet I think the cases with DPP, the, the public prosecutor here in Ireland. Um, so I'm hoping that someday somebody will be brought to book for that because there was no need for it. But your poem could equally apply to that George, the two Georges. So it struck a chord with me. Thank you, Therese. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. I, I, found, I find that poem moving also for the reason that you've written it from the perspective of the deceased mother and in some ways it, it it it's quite emotional because of that because you know you realize that uh he, he's his mother's son you know there's a and that is that is moving in itself to see him as a as a baby who is then you know comes to that point in life but it's in some ways also uh inspirational because because you, you you suggest uh, and I believe in that you suggest a connection that got, that transcends life, so it's beyond death, and that, that is a consolation in a way. So that, that 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 moves me quite. I mean, a lot of your poetry moves <coughs> me emotionally, but I, I, re I really love the poem about your brain um, injury. Actually, I thought I really loved the way you use the sort of scientific language for one thing because it's so unusual and the way you actually transported us into this absolutely magical world through scientific language. I thought it was absolutely just so fabulous. I loved it. Thank you very much. And um, I, I should share, I have a relative who passed away this year and it, I don't know if you heard of the Hubble telescope at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah it's my famous. relative was, um, my uncle was a mathematician and he was on the team that helped to design that telescope wow. uh, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what that means for me, um, that's really awesome. But for me, I'm somebody's niece who had somebody to talk to about all my nerd stuff that I really like talking about, um, the galaxy and who was, one of several super duper smart people um, that I had the pleasure of meeting in my family who spoke to us like a human being. Um, you know, we were just people he loved and he was so patient. You know, you could talk to him about these things in the galaxy and he made it seem so normal and just, matter of fact and you could ask all these questions and um for me that made science i was already interested and had been studying those kinds of things since i was a young girl it was my own personal interest but it really did mean a lot to have people to talk to and so it shows up in my work because it's something i love very much and I, I see it in everything. I, I see the relationship of the galaxy and you know um, in everything, as well as here on the ground nature. So I'm very grateful that you mentioned that because there's so many reasons it means so much to me. And now when I read the poem and he's been gone for uh, and since April, as another layer of meaning to me to feel really proud to talk about these things, especially as a woman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Catrice, very, very much. And thank you everyone for your contributions and for your presence here because, you know, it's, it's so Mosa, could I just uh, come in? Okay. Yeah, so just to, as you say, pluck up the courage and try and come out of the shell. Uh, firstly, Catrice, thanks very much for such a, a fabulous reading of poetry. Um, I think your connectedness with yourself um, and the issues that you deal with are very, very encouraging. 
Uh, I loved your Mama Menzies. I think there was a tremendous line there of connection um, between Mama Menzies, whether Mama is alive or whether Mama is dead. That connection still continues. Um, there's like a three prong. That was the first of the prongs. The second was um, your acceptance of your various situations that you found yourself with your uh, operations, etc. Um, I found particularly encouraging. I'm, I'm sort of grappling with Parkinsonism at the moment, and there's this, there's this double-edged sword of wanting to try to live with it as normally as possible, but at the same time to hide it and to um, to, run, to run away from it. So I think it's it's like I feel as though I can actually approach it with renewed steps of, of vigor to say, look, this is how it is. It might not be how you want it to be, but this is how it is. And within that framework of acceptance, it comes, of course, different strengths and different um, outlooks as well. Um, there was something else I wanted to say as well, which which has uh, unfortunately eluded me. But I just loved your work, uh, your bravery, and uh, thank you, thank you so much. Onwards and upwards, as they say. So, blessings. Maybe you wanted to. Maybe you wanted to say that the very first De Barras event with the guest poet was in Mental Health Week, and it was me performing. Um, and this was okay. just a few weeks after recovering from uh, after going through my brain surgery after. I, I remember you saying. Well. So uh, yeah, in that with that ear, I was listening to you, Cat Catrice, um, eight years in. So uh, yeah, um, the brain comes into the poetry automatically, <laughs> doesn't it? And it does. Uh, it does do so so good to have people to talk to. Um, I found that in uh, a charity here in Ireland called Headway um, and without them I don't think I would have found my way as well out of the confusion uh, in the beginning or the you know the time when you struggle with adapting to the fact that you have a brain injury and life has changed so yeah um, you know fight on girl <laughs> thank you so much thank you for that you know I, I feel like it's, it's a layer of self-love, really, you know, um, because I, I can't possibly be okay and other myself at the same time and feel like I'm, an, I'm alien to my own self. So, you know, part of, just like we use grounding techniques and imagery, and it sounds woohoo to some people, but at the very least, it's very encouraging, you know, to imagine that you're healing in these spaces that we can immediately touch. I feel that gratitude is just as powerful. Um, I agree. Gratitude is so important. And, and the, the little successes of recovering are a wonderful experience. This little moment of, right. hey, I can do that again. It is such a delightful journey. It, and it continues on and on and on. And so that is very positive, actually. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone who wants to, um, I mean, Catrice, do, do you want to say some more about a specific kind of writing? Because I, you told me that you were, you are, I think you're part of a community also that is exploring writing and healing in combination. And you, you are, a, or, you know, you've studied psychology. Could you say anything more about that as an, uh, yeah, to close? Uh, that's true. So I was an English literature major. That's what I graduated with a degree in. Uh, when I went back to school later, I picked up psychology, but I didn't finish. I walked across the stage, but my, my last year was so tumultuous. It was an undiagnosed brain injury. So uh, there are two classes that I really need and probably two more than I need to retake. Uh, the trajectory was to go um, that fall into a clinical program for graduate studies, but that did not happen, life happens. And then the next year I got hit by a truck and that just really settled the score. So I was in a vehicle though, <laughs> but I still got <laughs> Anyway, uh, to be clear, so I say that to say that, yes, I had the intention of doing something clinical um, to help the, um, to help other people heal and walk with them. Turns out that was not the plan that uh, God had for me in, in, in the immediacy. So right now, the pandemic has been amazing. I've met so many people and I have met a wellness for well-being community. 
uh, in Scotland and in the UK. So Lapidus Scotland, uh, I've been writing with them for some time for over a year or so, uh, well, well over a year now. And, uh, and I also am a member of their international um, community that does research for wellness for well-being, which is qualitative. So interesting enough, I do get to now use some of those research methods. Um, and basically it is to it is to make clear the different modalities of teaching wellness writing and how effective that is uh, in different ways for people to find their voices in challenging circumstances for healing, for overall wellness, for coping. It doesn't mean that it's a salve or a cure immediately. It's, it's another modality to help you through. And uh, art therapy, so to speak. And so um, many practitioners and facilitators are coming at this from very different ways and using it for a multitude of, of challenges. For some, it would be to talk about and, and, and cope through experiencing racism. For some, it would be coping through disability. For others, it's coping through grief. Uh, there's just so many and different types of trauma or stressors or dealing with things just in general, having a voice, finding your voice. There, there are wonderful people in the world that may feel their voices are buried deep down inside and no one is listening. But on the page, on the page, your voice has center stage without interruption mm. and get to blossom and bloom and take care of yourself um, and co-facilitate your own healing. And um, so in that way, there are so many things that are exciting that are happening. I could go on. <laughs> Thanks for asking me. Patrice, I just need to let you know, my sister years ago used to run um, a day centre for older older adults with Alzheimer's and dementia. And she said that she'd got, she, and she, she, she ran poetry groups with them. And she said she got better results from the poetry than they ever did with drug therapy. She said it was amazing what a huge difference it made and how, you know, people just came to life. But unfortunately, you don't get funding for, for poetry. You, you know, you only get funding for research for drugs. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's terrible. But I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It does mean a lot. And it's, it tells us that there's opportunity there. It tells us that that is a space where there's opportunity, where mm. we can build relationships within our global community uh, given in the pandemic, people did gravitate to poetry and they did gravitate to spoken word. And they did gravitate to the arts in many ways. And, and we have the numbers to prove that in so many areas. So stay tuned. Perhaps that will change regarding funding. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who is a very successful French horn player for for decades in Germany. He's American, but he couldn't get work here. But he is now sort of semi-retired and he, along with a lot of very famous and skilled classical instrumentalists are playing in this research group in a, a clinic in Switzerland with uh, clients who have dementia or Alzheimer's. And they're using their instruments not to play melodies but almost like jazz musicians play in harmony to see what they can how they can engage people and will it impact you know the way they can use their brain a lot of really interesting things happening now it's interesting how memory works what they remember and what they don't and how far back and how, what brings people to life music does amazing things and, to, and, and even with poetry to that, and when we talk about cadence and meter, uh, you know, there's music in the words, there's music in the poetry, mm. and people may be gravitating to, uh, when, in regards to poetry, remembering these rhythms, these, these patterns. Um, but thank you very much. I, I, could, I could talk to you lovely people all night. And I love Zoom because if we were in a group, it would be hard for me to see all of your faces. 
the Zoom, I can see all of your faces and take in your smiles and your micro expressions and they're so warm. So it's wonderful to see you. And I really am very grateful that you've come today to allow me to read to you. Thank you. Oh, I think the pleasure is mutual, Catrice. <laughs> um, I'm going to just stop the recording now because then we have two different uh, YouTube videos and then afterwards we can start the open mic. Thank you again, Catrice Greer.